on the right. How could you possibly, how could you possibly not just credit the media with great reporting when they report something? It's because within three hours, half of this stuff gets discredited. Half is a little much, but a certain percentage of the stuff gets discredited. So, for example, there was a report from CNN. And the report from CNN said that on September 4th, there was an email that was sent to the Trump administration, to Donald J. Trump, to Donald, to Donald Trump Jr., to other members of the administration, and that this email had a key code, a decryption key, for WikiLeaks that had not yet been released publicly. That's a big scandal. If it turns out, then that's one step removed from actual collusion, right? If it turns out that the WikiLeaks people, at the behest of the Russian government, sent a decryption key to the Trump administration and the Trump campaign, and that the Trump campaign used it in order to go in and spy on Hillary Clinton's emails before those things were released publicly, that would look a lot like collusion, would it not? It turns out every element of the story is bullcrap, every single one. So first of all, the email was not sent on September 4th, before the WikiLeaks were leaked. It was sent on September 14th, after they were already public information. You didn't need a decryption key for public information. Number two, there's no evidence that Donald Trump Jr. or Donald Trump ever saw this email. Number three, there's no evidence that the email itself is legit, that it didn't just come from some spammer. So the way that this originally was run, the way the original headline was run, was something like, I want to I wanna find, if I can, the actual headline, CNN report, Trump and Trump Jr. got September 2016 email with decryption key. Right Here's what David Wright from CNN tweeted. He tweeted, Candidate Donald Trump, Donald Trump Jr., and others in the Trump org received email in September 2016 offering a decryption key and website address for hacked WikiLeaks documents, according to email provided to congressional investigators. Right, bombshell. Before any of this was public, they were being offered a special in by WikiLeaks, a.k.a. the Russian government. Except again, it turns out it may not have come from the Russian government. There's no evidence Trump looked at it. And the email came 10 days after the initial CNN report said, which means that the email came out after all the information was public. I mean, this is a Brian Ross level screw up. It is a massive, massive screw up. It, somebody needs to get suspended for it at the very least because to misreport in that dramatic a fashion does a disservice to the Trump administration. Then you wonder why Trump runs around shouting fake news. You wonder why Republicans distrust reporting from places like the Washington Post. You wonder why Republicans have now come to the conclusion that nothing can be trusted. Part of it is because they're taking the message too far, but part of it is because there is a grain of truth, which is that a lot of the media are willing to jump on stories that have not been vetted and are not true in order to promulgate a particular narrative. And this is just the best example of that. Democrats are doing this too. Representative Julian Castro, who has presidential aspirations, he comes out and he says that, don't worry, even though there really is no hard information connecting Trump and Russia at this point, disturbing things will definitely come out. I mean, come on. Well, as you know, uh, I can't discuss uh, most of that stuff now. But, uh, you know, I told you months ago, and when I said it back then, I think it was considered a little bit brash, but I said, I think in April, that I thought that there would be people who would end up in jail. And, uh, and as I stand here now, I think that there are going to be some things that come out that will be very surprising and disturbing. Pause it right there, because I just want to read the Chiron, right? This was earlier, well, as, this was earlier yesterday, and it says, CNN exclusive, undisclosed email show follow-up after Don Jr. meeting with Russians at Trump Tower. But the follow-up didn't actually have anything bad to that either. There's no evidence that any follow-up was even responded to by the Trump people. So everything that CNN is reporting, and when you watch CNN, half their coverage is about Russia stuff. There, not only is there no smoking gun, there's no bullet, there's no gun. Like we, we, I don't even know what these stories are supposed to be proving when they're this bad. And then, they, and then again, it's amazing to me. People are wondering, how could it possibly be? How could it possibly be that people don't trust the mainstream media? This is why people don't trust the mainstream media, seriously. Okay, meanwhile, there's more fallout over the Jerusalem situation. So Donald Trump, I have to give him credit for this tweet. This tweet, he gets credit for it. Uh, he moved the, he says he's going to move the embassy to Jerusalem, acknowledges Jerusalem is the capital of Israel, as I've said, in a, a move of moral bravery and courage. Um, and he released this tweet, which is, I have to say, pretty funny. This is Trump taunting the, uh, this 13. Jerusalem is still the capital of Israel and must remain an undivided city accessible to all. As soon as I take office, I will begin the process of moving the United States ambassador to the city of Israel as chosen as its capital. I continue to say that uh, Jerusalem will be the capital of Israel, and I have said that before and I will say it again. And Jerusalem will remain the capital of Israel and it must remain undivided. We will move the American embassy to the eternal capital of the Jewish people, Jerusalem.
Therefore, I have determined that it is time to officially recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. And he tweeted out, well, pre above this, I fulfilled my campaign promise. Others didn't. Full credit to Trump. This is exactly true. Now, there's a lot of violence that has been breaking out uh, around the world. There are clashes in, uh, in Judea, Samaria, and the Gaza Strip. Hamas, of course, is calling for an uprising because they're a terrorist group. That's what they do. One Palestinian protester has been shot dead. But to be frank with you, the levels of terrorism that I've seen so far, the levels of violence that I've seen so far, have been relatively innocuous. So they say that there are rallies in Malaysia, Indonesia, Iran, Syria, and even America. Ooh. You mean people in Syria are angry? Oh, noes. You mean people in Iran are upset? Well, I guess that changes everything because Iran was our best friend before. You mean Muslims in Malaysia are very upset about things? Well, unless people are actually like getting hurt or killed, I don't really see, so what? They're protests, big, big freaking deal. They protest over, if you, if you said tomorrow, we're gonna have a day of rage, well, we'll call it the Nakba, right? The day that Israel was established, the Palestinians called the Nakba, the disaster. We'll have a day of rage on that day. You'd have the same people protesting. It has nothing to do with Jerusalem. It has to do with the fact they hate Israel. It's that simple. So Thursday, apparently, there were 16 Palestinians wounded. They said that most of the injuries were from tear gas and rubber bullets. Um, and, uh, and of course, you have all of, the, uh, all of the usual leftist suspects saying this is going to be the end of the world. It won't be the end of the world. Trump was right to do it. I, I do want to point out how the media have exacerbated the situation. So Richard Engel, the media like to embed in the Middle East uh, in, in places like Gaza. And then they just stand around with cameras and watch people burn their own towns. And then they treat it as though some, something heroic is taking place. This is in Ramallah. Ramallah is completely run by the Palestinian Authority. The Israelis do not run Ramallah. And Richard Engel, uh, over on NBC, here is, here's him reporting. Good morning. As you can probably see, clashes and civil unrest have broken out here in the West Bank. We are on the outskirts of the Palestinian city of Ramallah. These protesters have begun uh, setting fires. They're burning tires to create a smoke screen, and they are throwing stones and other debris. It's difficult to see, but behind this smoke are Israeli troops, and they have been firing volleys of tear gas occasionally to drive the demonstrators back. All these protesters say they are here for one reason, because Palestinians they say will not give up on their right to Jerusalem no matter what President Trump says. Okay, well, the, the media, look at the excitement from Richard Engel. You can see the media are really turned on about all of this. What would happen? Let, let me just pose something. What would happen if the media minimized the coverage? In the same way that the media minimized the coverage of serial killers, but this, this seems to me very much like the coverage of the riots in Ferguson or the riots in Baltimore. The media love this stuff and they egg it on and then they're surprised when violence breaks out. That, that doesn't wash. It doesn't wash at all. Okay, so... Uh, in other news, uh, th there are a couple of stories that are, are kind of astonishing today. So one is uh, with regard to yours truly. So apparently I was supposed to speak at Concordia College, uh, Concordia College in Moorhead, I think it's in New Hampshire, um, and they had funded it. Uh, the Student Government Association had voted to fund it in November 30th. They had voted 13 to 10 to allocate about $7,000 to Young Americas for Freedom uh, to fund one of my appearances. And now student leaders voted 28 to 2 against funding it. So they withdrew the funding. More than 150 students and faculty filled Barry Auditorium for an hour-long discussion leading up to the vote that nullified a previous decision to have me. And the SGA sent an executive email, said SGA's first goal is to listen to, represent, and act on the feedback of its students, and there will be a motion put forward to rescind the funding. You are welcome to add to the discussion during the meeting. Some Concordia students, according to the motion to rescind funding, have asserted that Shapiro's harmful messages targeting LGBTQQYALZ communities and other marginalized identities is in direct opposition to the dedication of Concordia and SGA to support diversity, equity, and inclusion of all persons from all backgrounds and identities. So this was an appeasement move. Uh, it's pretty astonishing and, uh, and pretty obvious. Young Americans for Freedom uh, at Concordia, they said bringing Ben Shapiro to campus would be a sign from Concordia College that they value intellectual and political diversity and that they care about the marginalized and underrepresented conservative, underrepresented conservative voices on campus, but they're not going to do it. Uh, they've decided that uh, it's not about diversity. Instead, it's mostly about shutting down people who you don't like.
Okay, so let's talk about this. Let's bring in editor-in-chief of the Daily Wire and Breitbart's former editor-at-large, Ben Shapiro, and host of CNN's Reliable Sources, Brian Stelcher. Welcome to both of Good you. Good morning. Good morning. Ben, ben I want to start with you. Um, Steve Bannon's comments. First of all, your, your initial thoughts. Well, I mean, I think that Steve's, first of all, I think you actually quote Steve completely. So when you say that he says the media should shut up, what he actually said is the media should shut up and listen more to the American people so that they can get better at their job was essentially trying to say, uh, look, I'm not, as everyone knows, I'm not a big Steve Bannon defender. I'm not, I'm not a big Steve Bannon fan. He's one of the worst people I personally know, but that has nothing to do with what he's saying here. I think that what he's actually saying here is not entirely incorrect. There is a vast gap between the media's perception of itself and the public perception of the media. The reason Trump keeps picking fights with the media is because it's a fight he can win. The American people don't actually trust the media at this point, mainly because the media seem like they're representing their own interests. We're like a separate class, as opposed to people who are defending the interests of the American people. And the more we get into slap fights with the administration, the more we get into slap fights with politicians on behalf of the press, on behalf of the media, instead of on behalf of the American people, the more the American people are going to be likely to just ignore it. The no, more no, they're just going to say, okay, it's another slap I understand, fight, right? I understand where you're coming from, and, and I understand there's a lack of trust in media, but people are certainly watching us, Brian, because if you add up the numbers of CBS, NBC, ABC, and CNN, there are millions of viewers, right? Yeah, this is just the data for the nightly newscast. I tried to pick 6.30 p.m. because it's the best way to show who's tuning in every night. This is NBC, ABC, CBS, plus CNN at that hour, about 27 million on an average night uh, last week. Now, that's a snapshot in time, right? Not everybody tunes in every day. Over time, most of the country is still paying attention to these traditional media outlets, as well as new digital outlets, like the one Ben's at, uh, like the Huffington Post and the BuzzFeeds and the Daily Callers of the world. You know, there's a very complicated media ecosystem out there now. Uh, and I think, you know, we hear Trump kind of attacking the media in general, but there is no one media and there is no one American people. Uh, many, many Americans are... Uh, demanding that the press fact check the new president but at the same time many Americans are skeptical of the press you know it's a very complicated well, situation let me, let me put this by you Ben um, if, if a media entity is a cheerleader for Donald Trump and never puts his feet to the fire won't you lose the trust of the American public if you continue to do that consistently? I certainly would hope so. I certainly would hope so. I mean, I think that here's the thing. Every White House treats opposing media as the opposition. The Trump White House, I think, rightly looks at a lot of the mainstream media and says, you guys were the opposition during the campaign. You're still the opposition now. You don't particularly like me. And so you're going to be much more critical of me than friendly outlets like Fox News, for example. But the, the job of the media should be to understand that we're always the opposition. If we're the fourth estate and it's our job to check, the government and it's our job to check the White House. It shouldn't matter whether you like or dislike the person in the White House particularly. You should be treating the White House as your opposition. The fact that the media did not treat President Obama as much as the opposition as they are President Trump is giving Trump the opening to slap you guys around. And I think that he's largely correct in slapping the media around by saying that there is a bias that exists for Trump that didn't exist for Obama. The best way to respond to that for the media is not to defend ourselves by saying, well, that's an attack on the press. That's an attack on the media. It's to say, OK, look, say what you're going to say. It's either true or it's false. And then treat it as a true false statement as opposed to a fight between the media and Donald Trump because he's going to win that fight every time at least in the minds of the public. Well, well, the trucker from Michigan does not care if I understand what you're saying but but here's the difficulty for us Brian and I think you'll agree when when there is a blatant untruth told by President Trump for example the crowd size at the inauguration should we not call him out on that and ignore it because it doesn't really matter or in calling it out, does it make us seem like we're opposing him in some way, since we're not giving him the benefit of the doubt for something really inconsequential? Right, you're making it sound like a no-win situation, but I think the majority of Americans want us to be showing the evidence, showing the photos in that case, showing the video, and letting the facts stand wherever they may be. This is a president who has a 36% approval rating, according to Quinnipiac, 40% according to CNN's poll before the inauguration. This is not a president that the majority of the country uh, wants to only hear positive news. Yes, there are some viewers who only want to hear the positive. Uh, that is actually a minority, and I think we need to keep in mind there are many different constituencies, many different audiences that want different kinds of news right now in this very divided America. Okay, interesting topic. Thanks to both of you for stopping by, Ben Shapiro.